Dragonfly is a rotorcraft, basically a huge drone, that is actively being worked on by NASA. It is set to launch in July of 2028, and it should arrive on Saturn's moon Titan by around 2034. However, given that it was delayed countless times, it shouldn't be too surprising if it is delayed again. One thing that is potentially confusing about this rotorcraft is with regards to it being set to arrive at the equator of Titan. So it won't immediately get to explore the most notable feature of Titan, which are its huge liquid methane lakes, which are at the poles. And the poles are about 4000 kilometers away from the equator. The equator of Titan is still a fascinating place with huge areas covered with dark sand dunes, valleys, channels, bright mountainous regions and so on. However, there is no definitive evidence of lakes existing at the equator. At the very least, hopefully Dragonfly will get to find some puns of liquid methane that were not spotted from orbit by NASA's Cassini spacecraft due to the small size. Still, it's far from certain that such a thing will happen. So then the first question which will be addressed in this video is why did NASA decide to not send Dragonfly to the North Pole of Titan where it could explore the massive lakes? If not North Pole, what about South Pole where there are also lakes? The second question that will be addressed in this video is with regards to whether or not Dragonfly is capable of reaching at least one pole of Titan even after landing at the equator. One significant reason behind why NASA is sending Dragonfly to land at the equator is due to Titan's seasons. Because Titan is orbiting Saturn, that also means that in order to complete a full orbit around the Sun, it needs 29 years. So a Titanian year is 29.4 Earth years. Titan also has an axial tilt of 27 degrees relative to the equator of the Sun. So it is a bit more tilted than the Earth, which has an axial tilt of 23.5 degrees. Such an axial tilt of Titan also produces its seasons, which each last 7.3 years. So this would pose a problem for the exploration of Titan's lakes, of which the vast majority, and its most significant ones, are located at the North Pole of Titan. So during the winter, at the North Pole of Titan, most of those lakes are mostly in complete darkness for about seven years. Coincidentally, it also just so happens that Dragonfly is set to arrive on Titan about a decade from now, which is 2034, which is also exactly during the winter at the North Pole, where it's mostly just going to be very dark. So obviously not a good condition at all for a rotorcraft to explore. So, if realistically the lakes were set to be somehow explored by Dragonfly, NASA would probably want that to be in ideal conditions for that, which would be during the summer of the North Pole of Titan. It is a seven year period during which the lakes are nearly constantly under sunlight. By around 2025, Titan's North Pole is going to get less and less sunlight. And by around 2034, the North Pole is going to receive very little sunlight with most lakes being in complete darkness. It won't be until around 2040 when the North Polar Lakes will start again to emerge out of darkness. Now, of course, there is still the option of exploring the South Polar Lakes, which will be under constant sunlight in 2034. There are not nearly as many of them on the South Pole, however, there is still one that is very large. I'm talking about Ontario which is about 15,000 km square, which is also about 4,000 km square smaller compared to Lake Ontario, which is in North America. However, despite the enormous size of Ontario on Titan, it's surprisingly shallow, with an average depth of only about 2 meters and a maximum depth of 7 meters. There is also a river delta connected to this shallow lake. Besides Ontario, there are at least two other much smaller lakes at the South Pole. But overall besides that, the South Pole is pretty empty. Since this area would be mostly in daylight during 2034, it does make it much more appealing for exploration compared to the North Pole during that same time. So the question is, 
Why is a dragonfly, then, set to land at the South Pole of Titan? It will have the necessary daylight in 2034, allowing for direct communication with the Earth constantly. The truth is, we can't really say for sure why NASA chose the exploration of the equator over the poles where the lakes are. However, most reasons could be boiled down to probably safety. Because the poles are much more wet overall compared to the equator, Dragonfly could accidentally land in a puddle of liquid methane that cannot be seen from orbit, which would probably be very bad for the rotorcraft. Still, considering that Dragonfly should have automated landing where it automatically decides carefully where to land, then it should be able to detect and avoid puddles. Automated landing is useful even in dry areas so as to avoid steep terrain which could damage the spacecraft. Automated landing is specifically very useful for Titan since real-time communication with the rotorcraft as to where to land isn't an option on Titan as it's very far away. Even signals traveling at the speed of light from Earth need about one hour to reach Titan at best, when Earth and Titan are closest to each other. Now, even if the rotorcraft malfunctioned and landed directly in the puddles, it is also then unlikely that the puddles would submerge the rotorcraft such that it is engulfed in liquid methane. That is because Dragonfly is enormous. It is said to be about 450 kilograms. The blades of the rotorcraft alone are 1.3 meters long, and it is supposed to be the size of the largest Mars rovers. Perseverance, for example, is 2.2 meters tall, 3 meters long, and about 2.7 meters wide. So overall, Dragonfly could be automated to avoid puddles of methane, and even if that system fails, if it lands in one, the puddle probably won't be significant enough to submerge the rotorcraft. On top of that, puddles of methane might be extremely rare, even on the poles. Another potential problem could be rain. Rain on Titan was confirmed, with a lot of variation in where and how much it rains. The poles, however, have seasonal rainfall, which is significant enough to influence the liquid levels of lakes. The speed at which rain falls on Titan is about 1.6 meters per second much slower compared to the speed at which it falls on Earth, which is 9.2 meters per second. The raindrops on Titan are also large. Rainfall could obviously pose a serious problem for the rotorcraft if it's not methane-proofed. But then again, there probably is a way to methane-proof the rotorcraft, which could enable it to safely explore the polar regions. So overall, it doesn't seem to be a very bad idea to directly send Dragonfly to the South Pole of Titan. However, it is understandable that NASA doesn't want to take any chances, no matter how small with the rotorcraft. The dry parts of the polar regions were not examined as thoroughly, so it is an area that has a lot more unknowns overall compared to certain parts of the equator. At one point in the Dragonfly mission proposal planning, there was an idea of putting flotation rings on Dragonfly so that it floats on methane allowing it to explore lakes. Back then, likely the idea was to send it directly to lakes. That idea, however, did not pass, probably due to the unknown problems that could arise from such a capability, plus the nature of the mission would be a lot more risky, as we don't exactly know what to expect with the lakes and the land around the lakes. Instead, what was chosen was something with a higher chance of working properly which is just basically having a drone that explores around dry areas instead. The idea was partially already tested by the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars. However, flights on Titan should be achievable even much more easily. Not just much more easily compared to Mars, but also compared to Earth. The surface gravity of Titan is 1.3 meters per second square, much lower compared to Earth's surface gravity which is 9.8 meters per second square. At the same time, Titan has an atmosphere with pressure 1.5 times greater on the surface compared to the surface pressure on Earth. Such an atmosphere and gravity together allows for flight to be achieved with much less energy required on Titan compared to Earth. The fact that flight is so easy to achieve on Titan is also why before the Dragonfly proposal was approved, there were also some other proposals to have something flying 
in the atmosphere of Titan. For example, the 2006 Titan Prebiotic Explorer was an idea to have a hot air balloon flying along with an orbiter. The 2010 Aviator was an idea to have a nuclear-powered airplane. However, overall, the rotorcraft idea seems to make the most amount of sense for Titan, which is why it was approved. As to why Dragonfly landing in and exploring the equator is safer compared to a mission where it lands at the poles, one reason is simply information. During the landing of Titan, which should be in 2034, that is also almost exactly one titanium year away from when the Hygens lander landed back in 2005. So we have data with regards to what the atmosphere is like at the equator of Titan during that time of the year, which is useful for landing safely. On top of that, we now know that the equator is a very safe place for a landing, especially the region where Dragonfly should land in, which is the Shangri-La Desert filled with dunes. If it lands in the interdune region, it should be very safe. That site is also only a couple of hundreds of kilometers away from the Hygen's landing site. So the reason as to why Dragonfly will be landing on the equator, as opposed to any of the poles, boils down mostly to safety. However, Dragonfly maybe has potential to reach lakes even after landing at the equator. The plan currently is to land in the Shangri-La Desert, and then in a series of flights eventually reach a crater called Selk that is 90 kilometers in diameter. However, there are seemingly no publicly known plans after that. It could be after Dragonfly reaches Selk that it is then decided for the rotorcraft to start heading towards the North Pole. Given enough years and a couple of thousands of kilometers crossed, it should be able to reach the lakes. It definitely has more than enough power to achieve that. The rotorcraft is not solar powered. Titan is too far away from the sun for that to be useful. Instead, it is powered by plutonium-238, a radioactive isotope. Essentially, Dragonfly will be nuclear-powered. Plutonium-238 has a very long half-life, meaning it provides heat for a very long time. That heat provided by the plutonium isotope is converted into electricity. At the start of the mission, it is expected for Dragonfly to generate 125 watts. But after whole 14 years, that is expected to drop down to 100 watts. Not a massive difference. This is also not a new way of powering things in space. Curiosity and Perseverance are also both nuclear powered, and such a stable source of energy is already proven to be very good, as Curiosity has been currently on Mars for 12 years, and so far it doesn't have energy issues. So, energy likely won't be a problem for Dragonfly reaching Titan's lakes. However, what could potentially pose a serious problem is durability of the blades on the rotorcraft. They could potentially wear out over time if they hit enough things in the atmosphere. Similar to how the wheels of rovers wear out over time. Another potential problem could be Dragonfly awkwardly landing. It potentially could land on a steep slope which could damage the rotorcraft. Still, awkward landings shouldn't really be much of a problem given that about 80% of Titan's surface is just a plane. On top of that, the automated system is designed to prevent awkward landings. If the landing system and blade durability are very good, then given enough time, Titan should be able to reach the lakes. How much time it would need to reach them, however, is hard to say. It is agreed that Dragonfly will fly in a series of flights, with each flight being around 8 kilometers in distance. It should technically be capable of achieving a much greater distance in a single flight, but that has some issues. So if every day during Titan's daylight, which lasts for 7.5 days, Dragonfly travels for 8 kilometers, then it would take only 2-3 to three years for the rotorcraft to reach the lakes at the North Pole of Titan. Of course, realistically, it probably won't happen that fast if NASA decides to actually steer the rotorcraft towards the North Pole after exploring the crater Selk, as along the way to the North Pole, there are probably going to be pauses during which energy is not going to be directed towards flight, 
but rather towards powering the instruments that are attached to Dragonfly, which help analyze the chemical makeup of the ground that it is on. It should also be able to measure atmospheric conditions and titan quakes. Cameras would also need to be powered in order so that images could be captured, which does include panoramas, so we should be getting some pretty good images of Titan's surface. Still, even if it takes a single flight every 16 days, that is one Titan day, and those flights are about 8 kilometers, even in that scenario, it should be able to reach the polar lakes in about 15 years. So even in a scenario where Dragonfly travels rather slowly, even then it should be doable. Now whether or not NASA actually decides to eventually steer the rotorcraft towards the lakes is not known, but it does seem possible and because of that it might happen. Although obviously not as initially envisioned, where Dragonfly was supposed to float on the lakes, rather if it does happen it's probably just going to capture images of lakes near shorelines which is pretty great. However, even if such a decision is eventually made with this rotorcraft, it probably won't be made shortly after Dragonfly lands, as in the beginning, an extremely cautious approach will be taken with flights, where after each flight, Dragonfly will return to the original landing site for safety. Eventually, it should slowly make its way towards the crater Selk. Then, after security is ensured, probably after at least a couple of years, is only when the reaching of lakes could maybe be announced. Even if Dragonfly doesn't ever reach lakes, it should still be an amazing mission. In terms of astrogeology, probably the most amazing mission so far, as Dragonfly will potentially travel many more kilometers than all of the rovers of Mars combined. On top of that, rovers on Mars are sort of stuck to traveling in a general area where they already landed, while Dragonfly will be able to examine many different general areas up close which will provide an abundance of information.